Okay, so I already did this voiceover once, but for some reason it was echoey and weird, so I have to redo it, which is a total bummer, but it's been a few days since I did the original recording, so I'm hoping that I'll have, like, a fresh take on it, and it won't be too frustrating to re-talk through the video, because it's not like I want to focus on, like, having to say the same things over again. I just kind of want to come at it from a new perspective, or just at least with a newfound concept confidence and just go ahead and make the video. So that's what I'm going to try and do. With that being said, my name is Roar Effluent, but feel free to call me Rory. And if you're new around here, hi, hello, how are you? Feel free to let me know in the comments and uh, stick around, suss out the vibe. I really like to create dope art content and hopefully a chill atmosphere. So if that sounds good to you, maybe check out this video. And if you're not new around here, what is up my dudes? I am, as always, very excited about this video. This painting was something that I ended up being really happy with and was a little bit more experimental than it was, I don't know, supposed to be, but in the end, yeah. Yeah, I was totally stoked with the way that it all turned out. As you can see here, I'm pulling from a few different references, a, an old Procreate mushroom sketch that I did a few months ago, and um, I'm looking up chanterelle mushrooms on uh, Pinterest to try and figure out how I want to draw these mushrooms. At the beginning of the video, uh, you saw a thumbnail that I started with. I find that thumbnails are great for paintings where you're trying to tackle a foreground, a background, and a middle ground, and, and a subject, and you know, you're just gonna have multiple colors going on. It's really helpful to plan out and map out where all of that is gonna go, and maybe even try two or three different color schemes, just to try and, and see where you want to place the colors, and have a plan before you go into a larger painting or a more, uh, I guess, finished or professional looking piece. Because uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be larger, but in this case, I was experimenting with uh, Arches watercolor paper, cold press, 300 GSM, I believe, so 140 pound. And um, I just really liked this doodle I did of these little birds chilling on some mushrooms, specifically chanterelle mushrooms. I love how, like, bumpy and rough in texture they are. I just, every time I look at those mushrooms, I get very excited and they have just this really specific feel and vibe about them that I jive with. So I always really love drawing and doodling chanterelle mushrooms. I'm really trying to capture the grit and the like gnarledness of the caps of these mushrooms and then I'm also really trying to capture the frills that are kind of like attached to the caps and are on the stems of the mushrooms. I think that they're just, I don't know, a texture that is really, really specific but really intriguing and really fun to draw. So I was trying very hard to capture that and, and I don't know, make sure that I had the essence of the chanterelle mushroom in the end and I, I actually do think that I did it. Uh, it just took a lot of fiddling and a little bit of help from some gouache which you'll see later. <laughs> I don't do a lot of paintings where I have like a foreground and a background and even really like a specific subject so I was really trying to in this larger painting uh, my goal was to 
I don't know, capture more detail to be able to draw something a little bit larger than I normally would and to really get into those nitty gritty textures. And that's honestly what I was able to accomplish with this, uh, this painting, which was really cool, really exciting. I was happy to be able to, I don't know, I was really happy to be able to draw something at this scale because it's not very normal for me. I was really used to in five by like eight and a half sketchbook and then to go to the eight and a half by 11 that I'm drawing in right now and now to even try to do um, painting on an arches watercolor block, which is, I believe, a 12 by 16. Uh, if I remember correctly. It was an old watercolor block that I had to get from school. Uh, we had to take a class that was dedicated to teaching me about, what was it? Uh, color theory and color mixing. Um, and I genuinely think that was about it. It wasn't exactly the most helpful class on the planet. If it actually taught us color theory, it would have been great, but it really didn't, which was kind of disappointing. Uh, it definitely felt like a waste of a class at the time, but I suppose I'm glad to have the watercolor block, even though it was like $80, which is way too much money for watercolor paper. If you're looking for, you know, like some watercolor paper to experiment with, I really love Cants and Montval. They have some really nice sketchbooks and cold press paper. For hot press, I really like Strathmore's uh, hot press paper. Normally they have a like, it's not a block, but it's more like postcards that you kind of rip from the top and they're like five by seven and the texture on their hot press paper is really nice because it feels more like a smooth-ish cold press. So there are so many other varieties of watercolor paper um, outside of really expensive ones like arches. And honestly, I don't even like working on arches too much. For me, it's way too much texture. Their cold press is insane. I mean, the Be Creative paper that I'm working on right now is cold press at the same GSM, I believe, uh, maybe a little lighter. And it's just so, like, the feel of the paper is like worlds away. This one is just so gritty and very rough. And I just, I don't know. I don't really understand what the goal of the texture of the paper is. Maybe to pick up on like the different granulating colors that a brand like Daniel Smith has, um, which I do have and own. It's just, I don't know. Arches has just never been a super comfortable paper for me. I mean, probably because of the price, definitely because of the price, <laughs> but also just in texture. It's not my thing. I've used their hot press paper and it was so weird. It was like smooth, but also like sandpapery. So, the, so like the texture was very fine and it was definitely there if you ran your finger across it. And then the paper, like that rough texture was uh, exacerbated when you added water onto the paper, which was just, like, super bizarre to me, so I just, ugh, I, I do not like arches. <laughs> Speaking specifically about the colors that I'm using, I let me think about this. I was using two to three, yeah, three color mixtures that I actually made for my palette. So um, I do get better in later videos about kind of trying to show you what colors I'm mixing for my palette. But at the moment, to get kind of as close as I wanted to to this uh, piece, it was just easier to zoom in a little bit, especially because I'm just, I'm using my iPhone, you know? I don't have a super fancy camera and it doesn't have like the widest, um, I don't know what you would call that, the widest scope <laughs> to capture. So um, I do try and be a little bit better about that, but um, just to explain, I created a green color mixture, which was Schmincke's olive green, mixed with I, Daniel Smith's, um, oh, what is it? Daniel Smith's uh, undersea green, I believe is the name of it, and uh, Schmincke's perylene green. And then for the purpley, violety color that I'm using, I used Schmincke's Indian Red mixed with Daniel Smith's Lunar Violet 
and a little bit of sepia from Schmincke and or St. Petersburg White Nights because I have them both and I use them kind of interchangeably. I find that Schmincke's sepia is a little bit warmer in tone where I prefer if I'm just using sepia, 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 however you want to pronounce it, um, if I'm just using it on its own, I prefer it to be much cooler. So I love uh, St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg's White Knight uh, sepia and indigo and oh, their natural black is also beautiful. But those are the colors that I use to kind of make those two color mixtures. And then you'll see me use a orange color mixture, which is like raw sienna mixed with Naples yellow from Windsor Newton Cotman and Schmincke respectively. At this point in the video, I'm really struggling to capture that gnarledness of the mushroom caps that I was really, really hoping to. So I kind of go back to Pinterest and I'm staring at a bunch of chanterelle mushrooms and I'm really trying to get that texture, really trying to add some more contrast because that was definitely what this piece was lacking, especially at this point in the video or the pr painting process for me. And I just, I started to kind of go in with a lot deeper tones and just really try and capture some of that uh, contrast that I felt I was seeing in the natural real mushrooms on Pinterest. And that's why in the end I end up breaking out the gouache because watercolor was just not cutting it in the contrast department. At this point in the video you'll start to see that there are some like cast shadows being thrown from my window onto my actual painting and you'll actually see that I end up taking a lot of inspiration when I was looking back at the uh the footage that I just filmed, I take a lot of inspiration from the shadow that ends up being cast onto my paper and add it to the piece because there was, there was just something super missing at this point. There was, you know, texture that needed to be added, which you're seeing me try to add here with the grass. Don't worry, that gets a lot better. I know it's not great right now, but so many paintings always go through ugly phases. So it's fine. And I wasn't like necessarily panicking. I was just getting a little frustrated because I knew that the painting needed more. I was really happy with kind of like the texture in the background that I was getting but it just gets better and better. So here I am starting to add some gouache to the mushrooms, which is definitely a step in the right direction in terms of those. But when it comes to the painting itself, the visual interest actually ends up coming from the shadows and the lighting that I use in the piece, which was not an original plan, but you'll see here in a moment that it gets really obvious that there's just this really clear slash, very harsh shadow. And honestly, I just loved the placement of it and I loved the addition of these golden colors across the piece where the light was still kind of quote unquote hitting the mushrooms and hitting the piece and so i actually just stared at the footage of the painting and then on my own uh added the the shadow and the sort of like golden glow to the piece which it'll cut to here in just a moment <laughs> and it was genuinely the like I don't know what to call it, the sprout of life that this painting needed. It gave it a little bit of zhuzh <laughs> and it really started to come together. I'm really trying to push that there's a background and a foreground in this painting. So I do think that I could have done a little bit more to maybe make the mushroom that's closest to the audience or the viewer darker. And then maybe the mushrooms that are farther back uh, lighter so that there was a little bit more of a contrast between the mushrooms and it really pushed that foreground to background difference uh, or maybe vice versa maybe the mushroom in the back should have been a little bit darker but that's okay you know I'm still end up being very happy with the overall feel of the piece especially once I add that shadow and the golden glow of light across the rest of the piece uh, it really starts to come together, but you can see here I'm, I'm kind of feeling the texture on the like grassy dirt part of the piece where the mushrooms are kind of sprouting out of this foliage. Uh, in my head, it's kind of just like mossy dirt maybe, and it's got, you know, some like sprouts of grass. I'm, and right here actually, right here as I'm doing this voiceover is the specific cast shadow or the specific shadow cast from my window that I end up integrating into the piece, which you'll see here like any second. So what you see here 
is the first kind of go at making sure that you can kind of tell the difference between the cast shadow, which I, um, I'm not sure that's actually a cast shadow. Well, it was a cast shadow from my window, but now it's just like a shadow in the painting. So I'm just gonna call it a shadow. So the shadow was just a mixture of Lunar Violet and Sodalite Genuine from Daniel Smith. And then the Golden Glow is like raw sienna, I believe, from Windsor Noon Common, just a really light wash of it. And so I did a glaze over the painting with the uh, Daniel Smith mixture. And then I did another glaze after that had dried with the Windsor Newton Cotman raw sienna to kind of get that golden effect. But I continue to push both of them a little bit to really just start to make everything pop and add that contrast. It always needs more contrast. <laughs> um, I find that contrast in so many different ways, size contrast, color contrast, grayscale contrast, um, it just, it helps really push a piece to that next level and adding some visual interest with these shadows was just another form of color contrast and another form of like almost thematic contrast as well. Like the sun is setting and so this part of the painting is golden and bright and the other part of the painting is a little bit darker. And uh, I end up really trying to push that shadow and really darken everything in the shadow and kind of add a golden glow to everything that's not in the shadow in that radiant sun. I go back to focusing on the background, trying to bring out the golden tones in the sun setting and really trying to make the greenery of the grass a little bit darker. Again, pushing texture. Um, you'll see me kind of return to the foreground a little bit to try and bring that grass to the front. Even have some pieces overlapping the um, foreground mushroom. I'm going in with Copic markers. I'm going in with colored pencils. And I'm kind of just doing that push and pull of, okay, so I added a little bit more and now it's dried. Ooh, that didn't dry as dark as I wanted it to. So let me go in again. And I'm really just kind of playing the long game with this painting and just adding layer after layer after layer and adding more detail after detail after detail until it finally gets to a point that I really appreciate and really like. And um, we were getting there with the uh, deepening of the frills of the mushrooms that was definitely helping especially that background mushroom really started to stand out to me I was actually really happy with it and I was really trying to push the um, frills and the contrast of the um, folds versus what's kind of sticking out of the mushroom and making those darker and lighter to really add some depth to the mushrooms themselves <laughs> I start to go in with my normal or usual ballpoint pen and the line thickness was just like not doing it for me. Normally the like very scratchy, I don't know, almost sketch like lines that I can get with the ballpoint pen, I really enjoy and like, but for this piece, number one, the texture on the arches paper was just obliterating it. Okay, it was not good, bad. <laughs> like code red, we need to fix something about this because the arches paper hated the ballpoint pen. And then, so what I do is I start to like look around my desk and try and see like, okay, 
what else can I use to line or ink the piece? Because honestly, I've been using the ballpoint pen for a couple years now, so I wasn't totally sure what I had. And what I end up finding is that I actually have a Tombow brush pen. It's the soft nib version of the Tombow brush pen. Normally you can buy them like Michael's or at Amazon. And normally you can buy them in a pair. So there's like a firmer tip and then a soft tip. And you'll see me go back in with the soft tip. And I end up really liking the line variation that I can get. And the thickness is super helpful for the piece because right now you literally can't even tell that I lined it. Before I figure out that it needs a thicker line, I go back in with colored pencil and I just keep kind of layering and layering textures and trying to make everything kind of pop a little bit more and deepen the shadows in the, the shadowed piece of the painting and really try to make sure that the foreground looks like it's a part of the foreground and that the background is in the background. And it really takes like till the final like few seconds of this footage, the painting doesn't feel finished and then it kind of just gets there which was an incredibly exciting um I don't know it was really exciting when I was finally able to finish it and this one has been one of the most fun to watch from start to finish and to see my development process as I went about trying to make this piece work I end up trying to add a uh, set of cast shadows that are being cast by the mushrooms to make the piece look a little bit more real and a little bit more realistic. It's not that I'm going for realism here, but when I want to add shadows and lighting to a piece, I want those shadows and the lighting to make sense. You know, I think everybody wants that. And sometimes people use, I don't know, like their style as a reason to have like poor fundamental, I don't know, poor fundamentals, I guess. And I just don't want to be one of those people. Just because I don't draw in a super realistic style doesn't mean that I don't want my shadows to make sense and the things that I'm drawing to feel like they are a part of the real world. So I was really focusing on the shadows, you know, that pressure led me to really wanting to make sure that, I don't know, the choices that I was making in terms of the lighting were making sense. And the end of this video is really me just trying to push that contrast, push the lighting, and make, sur make sure that the piece felt as, I don't know, grounded as it could possibly be.
even as I peel the tape right now, I'm not actually finished with the piece. I do go back and try to emphasize the, uh, the goldenness of the sun or the, uh, I don't know, like the light part of the piece where, where the light is kind of shining down on the mushrooms and the birds. Um, I go in with some Copic marker, I go in with some colored pencil, the usual, and I just really try to finalize the piece, which normally I try to do before I do the tape pull, but even after the tape pull, I was like, mm, I'm just not sure that it's as finished as I want it to be. It just needed a little bit more depth. It, it needed more. And so, I don't know, a way of checking that a piece is done for me is to peel the tape off. And if it feels done, it's done. And if it's not, I either try and retape it, or hopefully I can try and make the changes that I need to without having to retape the whole thing. And I do think that these final edits and, I don't know, accentuation do end up adding to the piece and I'm happy that I made them because it was just really um I don't know very fulfilling to go back in and add some of the highlights in the mushroom frills and push that foreground a little bit more with the colored pencil and as the final touch just emphasize that goldenness of the light on not only the mushrooms but also in the background. So overall, I would say that this experience, looking back, I think I would have expected myself to be a lot more um, frustrated and a lot more stressed about trying to make a piece that's not working work. And I genuinely feel like I was not very stressed. I did not feel very bad when I was in the process of this painting, which was incredibly encouraging because as I mentioned, I just, I feel like not only for a lot of artists, but myself, it's very easy to fall into a loop of, oh my God, it's not working. This isn't feeling right. You know, the shoe isn't fitting. What, what do I do? And then to either give up on a paint painting or maybe make a decision where it wasn't the best decision and it ends up making the piece worse, which totally blows when you do that. I mean, I've been there. <laughs> um, and so I was just really happy that I didn't do that and that the changes that I chose to make on the fly were changes and additions that genuinely helped the piece come together. It is not always that that happens. And I was really happy that I've gotten to a point in my art career where I can make those decisions I can make on the fly decisions that aren't super thought out and just look at a piece and be like, yeah, this is what it needs to be better. And then it actually makes it better. That's dope. That's totally sick. I'm just stoked that I was able to make this piece look the way that I wanted it to in the end. <laughs> The final thing I'm doing is just showing you guys how to remove a uh, painting from a watercolor block. If you've never seen it before, it's kind of weird, but there's always going to be some sort of cut in the tape on the edges where you can slip your X-Acto knife uh, between or underneath your paper and the in between oh my goodness underneath the paper or between the pad and your paper and just peel away from the painting and uh, slice gently very slowly through the um, I don't know, I guess through the tape or the adhesive, only on your painting. And what will happen is that it will be released and then the binding glue or tape will still be on the rest of the block so it's still totally usable and will stop your paper from warping. Watercolor blocks honestly are like pretty handy in terms of stopping the paper from warping. I just <laughs> am sometimes a little daunted by the fact that they are a singular block and not a sketchbook where I'm just like, I don't know, sketchbooks just feel a lot more freeing to me personally, and I'm sure they do to a lot of artists, honestly. Um, but I've also know plenty of artists who are very frightened by their sketchbooks because they want them to be perfect, and I'm definitely one of those people that wants my sketchbook to be perfect, but that doesn't make me afraid of it. And I don't know totally why, but uh, if you've stayed this far into the video, thank you so much. Feel free to do the youtube -y things that people always ask you to do, and I will hopefully see you in the next video.